Son of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear friends, our second conference today um, in May 2022 here in London for this uh, conference day of Juventutem on nature and grace. This morning we reflected on um, the state in which God created us, which was a state of uh, uh, nature perfected, but enhanced with uh, uh, qualities which uh, we lost uh, through the scene of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And you remember how um, even with people who don't believe in God and want to improve our human nature uh, through technology or genetic modifications, well, we don't agree necessarily with the steps they want to take and perhaps enforce. But we do agree with the fact that the human nature um, is on a process of improvement. And we believe that God is the one uh, leading that process through what we call the divine grace with which we collaborate to have our human nature um, healed from sin and its consequences and gradually improved and ultimately divinized. This sounds like a very bold statement and yet this is the will of God that we should become saints but more than that that we should through divine adoption become really children of God and through the beatific vision when we die in the state of grace and enter um, blissful eternity that we should be sort of incorporated um, to God in a way which we can't really fathom but which we know um, will uh, go beyond our uh, boldest hopes or expectations. And so having lost uh, our preternatural gifts uh, of integrity, immortality, infused knowledge and impassibility, having lost uh, the grace of God, habitual grace, through uh, the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, we now see how this is going to be restored uh, to us uh, through really what we call Christian life in general. And the first thing is uh, Holy Baptism. In Holy Baptism we become children of God and God takes possession of our person, body and soul. That's also why traditionally in the old rite of baptism there are many preparations before the actual sacrament. Uh, many exorcisms and insufflations and saliva and touching uh, you know, the ears and uh, sign of the cross. This is all to prepare the person, body and soul to expel any uh, hindrances, any evil influence uh, and to make sure that this uh, amazing, wonderful uh, grace uh, of uh, well, divine inhabitation and all the virtues will find us uh, a welcoming and receptive a soil as possible like when you put a precious seed uh, in your garden you make sure that all around is well prepared so at baptism we uh, become the children of God we start really with our natural faculties physical and spiritual God created us um, and even though we are children of Adam and Eve we know that our human nature is not destroyed it was wounded by sin, we inherit the original sin, and uh, with the grace of God, we know that we can uh, you know, rise to uh, a stature of sanctity. So at Holy Baptism, at the very moment the water uh, you know, touches the forehead of the candidate and the priest utters the sacred formula, uh, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, from that moment, uh, the candidate, duly prepared, um, becomes a child of God. Habitual grace, uh, about which I spoke this morning, is restored to that soul. It means that God dwells in that person. Up to then, God of course loved uh, <coughs> the person, God had created out of love that person and God was supporting into uh, physical, natural existence that person. But it is more to say 
that, in addition to all that, to the natural level, from a supernatural perspective, then at Holy Baptism, God comes to dwell inside the newly baptized, to make really his body and soul uh, his own, uh, God's own dwelling. From a, uh, again, natural perspective, there would have been virtues acquired by uh, this person. Uh, if it's a child, of course, it's a bit early for the child to exercise you know, intellect and will and to, to learn a lot. But suppose, as uh, I did just uh, last Sunday, in fact, in Warrington, baptizing an adult, uh, so somebody who had prepared for that and who had even, in the course of her life, acquired various skills and virtues um, from a natural perspective, like temperance or patience or kindness, etc. Um, so it's true that baptism does not create all this all of a sudden in us. There is something already present in us in terms of virtues at the natural level. But what baptism does is to bring in us the grace of God and also to bring in what we call the infused virtues. The infused virtues are special tools, special instruments, uh, supernatural equipment, we could say, of our soul, which make it um, fit to correspond with the grace of God and to, to bear fruit and to grow. And this supernatural equipment of the seven infused virtues uh, did not exist in the soul before baptism. At the very moment of baptism, this is brought by God through the sacrament into the soul of that person. Certainly at that stage, the uh, infused virtues, the three theological ones and uh, the four cardinal ones, are still at uh, a very uh, embryonic stage. And is going to take uh, the uh, uh, you know, good habits of Christian life uh, uh, a bit of piety, of prayer, learning our faith and works of charity, etc., to develop these seven infused virtues and uh, really make them reach the size and, and scope and range which God intends so as to be a, a fully developed spiritual uh, equipment. So let's have a look at uh, these uh, seven infused virtues, our, our spiritual uh, panoply or equipment or weaponry to, um, to grow as children of God. The three first ones are the theological virtues of faith, hope, and I'm sure everybody knows the third one, charity. Very good. So faith, hope, and charity. And uh, I have here the uh, compendium of uh, the Catechism of the Church. And uh, it's good because it's question and answers and very concise, so that is uh, very helpful to us. Um, let me just read what it says about the virtue of faith, uh, the first of the three theological virtues. That's paragraph 386. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God and all that he has revealed to us, and that the church proposes for our belief because God is truth itself. By faith, the human person freely commits himself to God. Therefore, the believer seeks to know and do the will of God because faith works through charity. So, to uh, summarize this, uh, faith is about, is a capacity, the, uh, you can also almost say the spiritual organ. Uh, whereby we are enabled to believe in, start with the creed of the Church, which we profess at Holy Mass. This uh, succession of paragraph of statements, there is a God, Holy Trinity, Incarnation, Redemption, Resurrection, the Church, the Sacraments, etc., the Saints. All these things are not easy to believe, um, you know, just at first reading, so to speak. We need to really embrace this as the truth uh, 
uh, with no violence to reason, but rather with reason, our intellect being enhanced uh, uh, through the act of faith, we need a specific virtue, and that is the theological virtue of faith. When we believe, uh, as God wants us to believe, uh, uh, guided by the Church, we are united to God in the utmost way here on earth. Through the act of faith, and therefore the virtue of faith which uh, permits it, we are united uh, with God. We know the object of our belief. We will see that object only after we die in, in heaven, but already now we embrace that invisible object of our love, that is God, and all his plan of redemption through the virtue of faith. So faith is not about uh, a feeling, right? Uh, it may be that sometimes somebody prays or reads even the creed and doesn't feel anything, or feels the opposite, feels rather, you know, I don't know, doubts or dryness or emptiness. Well, this has nothing to do with faith. Faith is in the intellect and the will, adhering through the motion of grace to uh, a, a body of data, of articles of faith, uh, ink on paper, which uh, are concepts uh, with a specific meaning, objective. When I say there are three persons in God, uh, this has a meaning, and it has to be interpreted according as the Church uh, teaches us, or speak of uh, transubstantiation, the real presence of Christ after the consecration in the bread and wine. All these things are technical to some extent. Reason is guided and brought further than its natural scope by faith so that we adhere to these things, not so much because they make sense, and they do make sense, and a lot of sense, but theologically because we trust in the authority of God who reveals these things to us through his church, God, being truth himself, as we heard in the definition, who can therefore neither deceive nor be deceived. And this is why we believe in faith. The second uh, theological virtue, if you remember, is that of hope. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire and await from God eternal life as our happiness, placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit to merit it and to persevere to the end of our earthly life. So faith is also about God, directly, just like uh, so hope, just like faith was. Um, it's all about God. God is the, the very purpose, you know, the, uh, the end uh, of this spiritual activity. But this time, it's not God as one to be believed, but as one to be reached, eventually. We are here on earth on a journey, sometimes a difficult one, arduous, meanderous journey, with you know, circumstances, accidents, encounters, disappointments, failures and successes. We believe that. This is not at random. We believe that we are walking in a particular direction, like the uh, Hebrew people in the desert. Perhaps it takes a while, perhaps you know, it's a bit dry sometimes, but ultimately we go to the promised land. And for us who come after Christ and as his members, the promised land is Christ himself. But the virtue of hope assures us that we will succeed, not of our own uh, skills and power, but relying on divine assistance, relying on divine grace. And when we are confronted with doubts, contradiction, obstacles, we do not waver, because the virtue of hope teaches us that God, who is trustworthy, will indeed provide for us all the means we need to succeed, to reach our end and fall into his arms when we die. What a wonderful virtue, virtue of hope, very much to uh, cultivate, sometimes a bit forgotten. The third theological virtue, perhaps the best known, is that of charity. Charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things and our neighbour as ourselves for the love of God. Jesus makes charity the new commandment, the fullness of the law. It is the bond of perfection and the foundation of the other virtues to which it gives life, inspiration 
and order. Without charity, St. Paul tells to uh, the Corinthians, I am nothing and I gain nothing. So charity is uh, uh, the crowning of, uh, of all the virtues. It is of the three theological virtues, as you may know, the only one that will uh, remain in eternity. Faith will go once we see the one in whom we will have believed on earth. Then there is no faith anymore. We see, there is vision. Hope will also end because there will be the embrace and possession of the one in whom we will have hoped. But charity, will charity cease when we meet with love itself? Surely not. It will only be increased and we will spend our eternity uh, experiencing that growth in divine charity uh, burning in our uh, human hearts. Charity is not to be uh, misunderstood with uh, philanthropy. There are many people who uh, come you know, to the assistance of others in a humanitarian crisis, etc., or more humbly and uh, locally to their neighbors, and this is very good. But unless, unless this is really inspired by God and in His name, unless this is uh, uh, a fruit from uh, the sacrament of baptism and uh, divine grace inhabiting that soul, then it is at the natural level only. What we are speaking about now is the theological virtue of charity and that means that we love by the power of God under his inspiration and for his glory. It is God we love first and everything else in dependence of him and for the love of him. So somebody who uh, denies the existence of God creator, good and rewarding, cannot have theological charity. It's just incompatible. This person may be of help to his neighbors and very good, but we are speaking of another reality, a purely natural one. Now here in this conference, we are concerned with supernatural realities and this is this uh, uh, crowning of the apparatus of virtues with the virtue of charity. So these three theological virtues, faith, hope and charity, did not exist in the soul of the unbaptized and start to exist at the moment of baptism. And it's not everything, there are another four uh, virtues which are lower in their sort of dignity and, uh, and scope, but certainly are also of great importance. The four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude and temperance. These four cardinal virtues are also infused uh, by God at holy baptism. Now for these four there would have been a sort of a natural preparation. Uh, you know, most of us, of course, would not have waited the day of our baptism, suppose they were baptized as adults, to be prudent, just to be careful about where you go, what you say, etc. Or to be just. Certainly, I mean, imagine somebody even uh, you know, has just his, his profession, a lawyer, etc., or a judge. Well, they would have looked into these matters even before being baptized fortitude as well, or, uh, thanks be to God, temperance. So it is not like a shift from a life of dissolution into a life of perfection at the very moment of baptism. And there is a natural preparation for some qualities which we may call, from a natural perspective, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. But what happens at baptism is that God, so to speak, doubles these four natural virtues and turns them into supernatural. So they reach uh, a height and a range, a capacity, which they simply didn't have before. It's like a supernatural activation of what up to then was a purely natural thing and now becomes a, an organism, so to speak, of the soul, which equips the soul to detect uh, the uh, divine motions, inspirations and promptings and to respond to them uh, according to the diversity of circumstances. 
in prudence, being careful uh, in what we say, but this time not only to uh, save our skin, uh, but rather to be of assistance to a neighbor, uh, somebody who perhaps, uh, I don't know, blasphemes the Lord, and uh, we, in our heart, as we are witnesses to that, we think, asking the Holy Ghost, Dear Holy Ghost, how can I best react in that situation, not for my safety, but for the good of that soul? How far can I go in uh, uh, admonishing or uh, reprimanding? Uh, must I keep silence? Must I speak? So, so many occasions like that, when we need that supernatural antenna connecting us with heaven and to tell us how the natural virtue of prudence now being uh, enhanced and converted into a supernatural uh, organ can be of use uh, to God and neighbor. Same thing with justice. Uh, that can happen you know, at work, for instance, and you see a customer uh, being not treated correctly, and again, you think, how can I intervene? You know, what, what can I do? But this time, not just to be a good uh, professional at the shop or at the workplace, but rather to be a member of Christ. How do we want justice to be done and uh, what is owed to somebody to be given him without uh, hindrances? The same with fortitude, fortitude where we try uh, to remain strong against the obstacles uh, and even when there is fear, we uh, try and arm ourselves uh, to resist uh, the pressure of fear so as to persevere in uh, the set direction. Now that again can be exercised at a natural level by many people. Think of, I don't know, uh, professional uh, sportsmen who uh, you know, have to uh, uh, develop their bodies and uh, fight a lot uh, on the playing field and, uh, and accomplish you know, real feats at a natural level. Well, fortitude would be enacted there, but purely natural. What we are speaking of now uh, from baptism is that supernatural reality of fortitude, which is a cardinal virtue. And the same for temperance, when we uh, moderate the use of bodily pleasures, uh, drink, etc., or sleep, uh, so as to uh, make use of created goods, uh, not as if they were an end in themselves, or as if we were the end, but rather as means to an end, which is God and our own sanctification. In every circumstance are true good, and to choose the right means for achieving it. Prudence guides the other virtues by pointing out their rule and measure. Justice. Justice consists in the firm and constant will to give to others their due. Justice towards God is called the virtue of religion. Fortitude assures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. It reaches even to the ability of possibly sacrificing one's own life for a just cause. That is, of course, uh, the cause of God and the Church. And we know those who do that are called the martyrs. Temperance moderates the attraction of pleasures assures the mastery of the will of our instincts and provides balance in the use of created goods. So you remember the water is running on the forehead of that uh, newly baptized person and God infuses in the soul um, this wonderful apparatus of a supernatural uh, ability, faith, hope, charity, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. But building upon that, which itself was building upon the natural level, it's like in you know, several layers, but happening uh, gradually. At the same time, in baptism, God also equips us with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And we are now uh, preparing for Pentecost and the sending of the Holy Ghost on the church. And so it's good to be reminded of this as the Catechism does, paragraph 389. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The gift of the Holy Spirit are permanent dispositions which make us docile in following divine inspirations. There are seven. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. 
theologians uh, to distinguish between the virtues and the gift of the Holy Spirit say, with the virtues, you're like on a boat, okay, and you're rowing. So you are equipped with that, uh, you know, these tools, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, to row, and, uh, but it's very much on your own uh, strength that you are able to move forward. Th those are the virtues. With the gifts of the Holy Ghost, it's like unfurling the sail to the wind. Now, the wind is not you. It's not your uh, breath, you know, coming out and propelling uh, the boat. It's not you using, at this stage, uh, your uh, muscles uh, to row. It is uh, that divine uh, breathe, uh, breath which comes uh, uh, upon you and uh, comes into the sail and brings uh, the whole uh, boat you know, forward. So there is a power there which is stronger, there is an origin which is directly divine, and uh, uh, it's not to replace the virtues, it is rather to uh, make them even stronger and the whole person is able to detect the promptings of God, the inspirations of divine grace, much quicker, much more subtly, and to respond to them also with much higher fidelity. That is what we see in the lives of the saints, even sometimes with episodes that may surprise us. Why is it that, uh, you know, St. Teresa of Avila uh, wrote this or made that decision which seemed to be contrary to, you know, whatever circumstance, or St. Francis of Assisi, or anyone you can think of. And uh, all these sort of peculiarities uh, which eventually we realize uh, did bear a lot of fruit these were simply their quick and faithful response to the Holy Ghost because uh, these uh, seven gifts and virtues had been implanted in them and had been developed to such a level that they were top quality and willing instruments in the hands of God. That is what the saints are. And uh, we should all ambition to uh, reach uh, a similar stage because indeed uh, the entire uh, purpose and uh, process I'm describing now is uh, uh, to grow to the fullness of Christ, to be conformed to Christ, to be configured to Christ who is the type, the uh, perfection of mankind. So we want to imitate our Lord, and just like in Him, the human nature was perfect with all the natural endowments of human nature, with a true body, with a true human soul, uh, uh, physical limbs and spiritual limbs, intellect, will, uh, memory, etc. But this uh, uh, united, of course, uh, to uh, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Son, and therefore the perfection which we want to imitate because in our Lord Jesus Christ uh, the human nature is uh, as close as ever can be to God and uh, this is what we all seek. So this growth in grace from uh, baptism, from uh, before that natural virtues you know, develop but then supernaturalized through baptism with um, the infused virtues then uh, further equipped with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, this is, dear friends, uh, our uh, spiritual uh, identity. This is something given us by God in addition to nature and something the more we learn about, the more we can make use of and therefore uh, the more fruit we can bear, that is, God through us. Let us briefly uh, take a look at uh, um, how this growth uh, in us takes place. First of all, it is God's initiatives, as I explained this morning, within grace, as a, as a notion, we distinguish between habitual grace, which is a state, a condition of friends and children of God, but we distinguish then secondarily with actual graces, which are 
immediate promptings from God upon a man, a woman, to help this person um, accomplish something, to act in a certain way. So God is the one prompting us and with that spiritual equipment we are able to understand that it is from God. Not to be mistaken, not to ignore it, not to be afraid, not to be lazy, selfish, but say, oh, God is asking me to uh, do this little act of generosity or, or purity or whatever. Well, I do it. I do it. So we answer the prompting because we have been well equipped by God himself. So God's initiatives, um, our own prayer, certainly, following God's initiative in response to it, is very important to uh, secure that growth, spiritual growth, in the life of grace, in us. So to pray regularly... Um, uh, liturgical prayer, certainly, uh, Holy Mass, of course, or the Divine Office, or, or then to pray together, or, or alone in the Holy Rosary, or uh, the Litany, or etc. But also private prayer, I insisted on this many times, especially contemplation, to be alone in a room, quiet, and just to speak to God heart to heart, as St. John Henry Newman would say. Then the seven sacraments. These are the means of sanctification instituted by our Lord himself for the explicit purpose of taking us to heaven. So let us have a lot of uh, um, you know, uh, reverence and love for the seven sacraments. Let us not take them for granted, and not only for us, but also for other people. You know, when you hear, oh, in the parish, uh, whichever day, there's a baptism. Well, it would be wrong to think, oh, I haven't been invited or it doesn't concern me, so I'm not going to go. Well, it does concern you, because if you are a Christian, then it's yet another member of the mystical body of Christ being uh, grafted into that spiritual organism. You are directly concerned by it, and you have every right and every reason to attend this baptism, even if you don't know anyone there. Same thing with the funeral, same thing with anything. If you're visiting a church, Holy Mass is taking place, uh, well, of course, you pray there, you know, if you can't stay the whole Mass, you stay a little, but... So, in other words, the sacraments, it's, it's a supernatural atmosphere we breathe, uh, simply put into practical shape so that we can access the grace of God through it. But it's not something private. So, for our own benefit, we want to receive them worthily and regularly, but also that ecclesial dimension of the sacraments, uh, we are part of it, we are interested, we are involved, uh, when other people receive some sacraments, it's never just for them, it's also for me. Just like when I receive, it's also for them. And then the merits. The merits are a very important um, you know, part of the theology of, of the church. And so I'll uh, perhaps conclude with that. The merit is... A human act deserving of divine reward. A human act deserving of human reward. This is something fascinating to realize that there is some sort of proportion between our very limited and, uh, and, and frail you know, efforts and initiatives on the one hand and what God will give us uh, as a response. Now, in a strict sense, of course, um, God is the one, as I explained, who took the first initiative, starting with creating us and then redeeming us uh, and then having us baptized, etc. So we are completely in his debt. So it's not as if at any stage we could you know, stand to God and say, you owe me. Never, never, never. Um, but there is, by God's you know, provision and benevolence, there is indeed some sort of proportion and uh, uh, a bit like a father with his little boy, little child, okay? Of course the father is stronger, of course the child owes everything to the father, but yet the father knows that it's good for the child to realize there is some sort of proportion that if the child does good, he will be rewarded, and that the father uh, considers himself as uh, uh, owing the child that reward of his own liberality. This Therefore, uh, the, our merits come from a promise of God that he will reward us because he is good and if we simply follow his law 
of growth, of life, of love, uh, of virtue, then uh, we will receive a hundredfold in, uh, in heaven. All our merits stem from the merits of Christ. That's another essential truth. That it's not as if uh, uh, I could bypass in any way the crucifixion here on my right and try and get you know, what I want from God, uh, like circumvening the passion and death of the Lord on the cross. No, no, no. Then if I, if I claim that I receive anything, then I can be sure it's not from God. So better not keep it. Um, but if I aim for any good to receive from God, it has to be uh, through Christ, through the Lord, because he's the only one who truly merited for us redemption and uh, eternal life. To merit, we need to be in the state of grace, uh, to really merit in a strict sense, what theologians called de condigne, strictly speaking. Our Lord tells us that a branch cannot bear fruit if cut off from the vine. So the fruit is from Christ, who is uh, uh, the root, and, um, and we bear fruit uh, in proportion of our actual union with him. And that means to be in the state of grace. It is for God, at least in as much as God is considered as the end of all our, our actions. Merit also has to be uh, about something freely undertaken. If I am forced to do something, well, then there is no merit. And also, it has to be before we die. After death, there is no merit, no demerit either. In fact, there is no change whatsoever to our physical uh, stature. So, if we want to uh, enter eternity with uh, many titles, to God's affection, uh, enabling us to spend uh, our eternity as close to Him uh, as we, we should wish, then this is based on our merits and that therefore has to be acquired before we die. So let's get to work. That's now. I don't enter, we don't have the time, into some distinctions between uh, various types of merit, but if you just remember the broad uh, lines I gave you, that would be sufficient for uh, this talk. A good news is that, should we lose God's grace, all our store of merits past can be recovered when we come back into God's grace. So it's not evaporated, okay? It's not like a bank account and there is a uh, you know, financial crash and uh, everything is gone and it's empty forever. No, uh, through God's bounty, as soon as we come back in God's grace, uh, these merits are again uh, ascribed to us and they are our sort of capital uh, of God's assistance and love for eternity. So I uh, conclude this uh, uh, second and last talk today on nature and grace. And uh, as you see, God created us in uh, uh, the state of natural perfection in Adam and Eve, but already enhanced uh, with gifts which are not owed to our human nature. We lost them all through sin, but we can uh, regain that state of friendship uh, regaining justice through baptism and uh, once we reach uh, heaven also the uh, other gifts uh, which we had lost. When we look at our Lord, at our Blessed Lady, we see that uh, they are tired, they are sad, they do suffer persecution, they are hungry, they are hated. So to undergo all that uh, which is always connected with sin as a consequence of it. This does not mean that we are doomed, since even our Lord and Our Lady went through that. So that's been encouraging for us. The point is, despite the fact that we have lost integrity, immortality, infused knowledge and impassibility, provided we have justice, that is, uh, friendship with God, habitual grace in our souls, then we are able to go through any hardship, including martyrdom, um, without being separated from Christ. 
just like Christ in his humanity never for once was separated from the Godhead. That's why he's our example and our blessed lady as well. So that must give us a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, zeal for God to know better about this spiritual apparatus which is given us through God's mercy at Holy Baptism and furthered and detailed in the other sacraments. Um, we must learn these things. That, that's why this conference is important. I know it sounds a bit technical, uh, but as you can see, it is the face of the church. And the more you know about it, uh, the more you can make use of it and, and bear fruit. And, and tell other people as well. Our faith is not a wishy-washy in a feeling or feeling good. It's something that is structured, just like some people will study anatomy and they will see the function and uh, the way the various organs you know, react one upon the other. Well, we have a spiritual, supernatural anatomy. And we look into that. We learn about it. It's not complicated. And uh, once we become familiar with it, we can even check, assess, how is my virtue of faith doing this morning? How is my virtue of prudence? Uh, how is my gift of the Holy Ghost of counsel in that situation? When I read this thing, when I visit that person, when I watch that film, how does that fit? And then more and more, this supernatural apparatus grows in us, uh, and we don't even need really to ask ourselves the question, because God is embracing um, our intellect and will to such an extent that we almost, almost spontaneously uh, do what, what he says. And it doesn't cost us. That's the great thing with virtue, that it creates, uh, um, uh, it makes the, the virtuous action uh, easy and pleasurable. That's what we see in, uh, in the life of the saints. So dear friends, let us be uh, full of happiness about this as we look uh, towards the coming of the Holy Ghost in just a few weeks at Pentecost, uh, and let us resolve to apply this for us, but also to share it with all our friends or even non-believers that they may join us in the mystical body of Christ and follow us and our head, our Lord, in heaven. Thank you.